Every now and again, when we're coming up with subjects for videos, we come across an individual who is truly a walking red flag in every way. This is one of those stories where it just keeps getting worse, and you're hoping that by the end, some sort of justice gets carried out. Nate Holzapfel grew up in Utah where his father Richard was a prominent writer and educator in the Mormon church. Richard wanted his five kids to follow in his footsteps, but Nate had discovered early on that he had the gift of the gab and decided to pursue a career in sales. He did well for himself selling cars and insurance in Utah, but he got tired of squandering his sales talent on other people's businesses. In 2012, Nate, his brother Zach, and their childhood friend Jeff Jensen invested $90,000 into starting their own company, Mission Belt. They produced leather belts that didn't have holes, and a dollar from every sale would go to a charitable cause. In 2013, 34-year-old Nate, the natural salesman of the team, appeared on a season 4 episode of Shark Tank, a reality show where aspiring entrepreneurs pitch their business ideas to a panel of investors. Nate burst onto millions of TV screens with his attention-grabbing pitch. He confidently explained how they reinvented the belt and designed a ratchet buckle that ensured the belts would always give the wearer the perfect fit. Nate wasn't shy about asserting his sales skills and described himself as a one-man sales force. He claimed that everyone he showed the belt to wanted to buy it. What he needed from the Sharks was access to their networks so Nate could sell the belts to more distributors and retailers. The Sharks were impressed with Mission Belt sales numbers and with Nate, who was clearly committed and a true go-getter. Mark Cuban exclaimed, I love you, I love you. Kevin O'Leary loved the product. I will buy one from you. Um, I like the product a lot, I'm gonna use it. In the end, Nate successfully struck a deal with Damon John, the founder of clothing brand FUBU, for a $50,000 investment for 37.5% of the company, plus the condition that Nate had to remain on as head of sales. In 2016, Nate appeared on Beyond the Tank to give an update on the status of Mission Belt. Business was booming. In the three and a half weeks after the initial Shark Tank episode aired, Mission Belt did over $1 million in sales. They had hired 45 employees and were now in 1,000 stores, but mostly small boutiques. Nate wanted Damon's help getting the belts into 20,000 big box stores. During the segment, we see Damon visiting the Utah warehouse and office for the first time. He also visited Nate's home and met his family. Nate had upgraded his 1997 station wagon for a brand new Mercedes and had moved out of his small apartment into a 10,000 square foot mansion in a gated community. The house had an indoor basketball court, cinema, and billiards room. We are also introduced to Nate's wife, Irene, and his two young kids. Damon expressed some concern about Nate's drastic lifestyle upgrade and cautioned him about living beyond his means and losing focus on the business. In the end, Damon advised against getting mission belts into big box stores. He reminded Nate that his strength was his sales skills and suggested he set a more conservative goal of 5,000 stores and personally visit the stores to conduct sales training for shop staff. Damon was so impressed with Nate's sales chops that he took him under his wing and had him working on some of his other Shark Tank investments, helping entrepreneurs with their sales skills, building their e-commerce platforms, and generally preparing their businesses for when their segment would air. One of the businesses Nate worked with was Bubba's Q. Retired NFL player Al Bubba Baker and his daughter Brittany pitched their family's line of deboned baby back ribs and barbecue sauces on Shark Tank in September 2013 and successfully struck a deal with Damon John, $300,000 for a 30% stake in the company. Damon's team immediately got the ball rolling and brought in Nate to build a brand new online store for Bubba's Q in time for when the Shark Tank episode would air. Bubba and his family were excited to sell their ribs and sauces online for the first time and were anticipating a huge wave of sales. Nate was supposedly some e-commerce genius, but he didn't have the website up and running until just three hours before the episode aired. But Bubba quickly forgave Nate when they brought in $250,000 in online orders over the next few days. Unfortunately, the excitement was short-lived. Nate had forgotten to install a sales tax function on the online shop, and the Baker family had to refund 14% of their total initial orders. 
Despite these hiccups, the Bakers continued to trust Damon John and his protege Nate, who eventually took control of the Bubba's Q business bank account. Nate kept the Bakers in the dark about their own financials. The Bakers were uncomfortable with this arrangement, but were under the impression that Nate was some millionaire business mogul, so they believed that this was the best thing for Bubba's Q to grow. However, after more issues with the promotions on the website, the Bakers decided to part ways with Nate. Brittany Baker was able to access the business account temporarily and saw that there was $100,000 in it. In June 2014, seven months after the Bubba's Q Shark Tank episode aired, Nate closed the bank account and sent the Bakers a check for only $8,000. The Bakers told the LA Times newspaper that they raised the alarm with Damon John, but the matter was not followed up. Meanwhile, Nate's own business, Mission Belt, was flourishing, and his profile was on the rise. He began to use his success story and Shark Tank appearances to get himself various speaking gigs and podcast spots, where he'd ramble about his backstory and sales techniques. Nate began to consider himself to be something of a shark, and decided to go all in at pursuing a career in TV and launching his own consulting business, The Nate State of Mind, and left Mission Belt shortly after his Beyond the Tank episode aired. To prepare for his new venture, Nate called in a favor from a friend of a friend, the late TV and radio host Larry King. Larry agreed to film a mock interview with Nate under the condition that it could only be submitted privately to TV producers as an audition tape. However, Nate ended up including clips from the mock interview in three public YouTube videos, which have all since been deleted, but had racked up a combined 65,000 views. He also included quotes, some real, some made up, from Larry King on his promotional material. You're selling me on laughing, read one quote from his press kit. Nate Holds Zapful is one of the best interviews I have ever had, claimed his website. Nate also included Larry King's logo on his website to further imply he had actually appeared on the talk show before. In late 2018, Larry King Enterprises sued Nate for trademark infringement and right of publicity violation and was awarded $250,000. Forty-six-year-old Courtney Morton had had a rough few years. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2014 and went through chemo, a double mastectomy, radiation, and two reconstructive surgeries. She got divorced in 2015, and when her father died in 2019, she became estranged from the rest of her family. On top of that, she was the primary caregiver of her disabled adult son. When the pandemic hit in early 2020, she felt more isolated than ever. Courtney was scrolling through Instagram one day when she received a follow request from someone named Nate Holzapfel. She didn't know him, but had a quick look at his profile. He was also from Utah and posted a lot of things about business and sales strategies. She accepted his request and they began messaging. Casual small talk soon developed into deeper conversations as they got to know each other. They had a lot in common. They were both Mormon, held similar political beliefs, and were both recently divorced with kids. After a few weeks of constant messaging and phone calls, Nate asked Courtney to meet up. Courtney told the Daily Beast news website that she went against her better judgment and agreed to a date at her house. They chatted for hours. Courtney got a bad feeling from Nate. However, she ignored her instincts again. Nate was clearly into her. He said all the right things, so she decided to give the romantic relationship a chance. For months, they spoke constantly, saw each other almost daily, and soon began to discuss marriage and blending their families. Nate didn't want to live in Courtney's house that she had shared with her ex-husband. Courtney was understanding and agreed to sell her house, which had been specially outfitted for her disabled son. Nate, the savvy finance man, instructed Courtney to protect her property's equity by putting it into a limited liability company, aka an LLC. However, instead of starting an LLC in Courtney's name, he said it would be easier to just put it into one of his existing LLCs. He then convinced her to sign a quit claim deed, which would transfer ownership of the house into Nate's name. In July 2020, Nate sold Courtney's house despite her pleas to transfer ownership back to her. Courtney had no idea that Nate had put $200,000 he made from the sale into an LLP, limited liability partnership, that he shared with his wife. She had no clue that Nate was still married. He spent the money on bills and guns, as well as the lawsuit that Larry King had filed against him. By the end of 2020, Courtney had all but ended her relationship with Nate. She had only received $11,000 from him and just wanted to get the rest of her money. 
However, Nate skirted around the issue and persuaded her to invest in one of his businesses. So Courtney sold one of her guns as well as her car and gave the money to Nate to invest. November 2020 was the last time Courtney ever heard from Nate. He had taken the money and disappeared. 45-year-old Sammy Turnbo was at a Utah auto shop with her brand new truck in July 2020. She was chatting with an employee about how she had just started her own business. She had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, finalized her divorce just one month ago, and was the main caregiver of her disabled son. She was excited to have achieved her dream of opening her own healing center in town, something she had been working hard towards for years. As she was telling the shop staff about her new venture, another customer interrupted. A 40-something man with brown hair and a beard confessed he overheard their conversation and asked Sammy a few questions about her business. Sammy politely answered before leaving. Later that night, Sammy received a text from an unknown number. She asked who it was, and to her surprise, it was the man who had asked her about her business at the auto shop. His name was Nate. He had Googled her business and tracked down her phone number. They started texting back and forth, and Sammy learned that Nate was quite a successful businessman. They met up the very next evening at Sammy's store to swap sales tips. At first, their discussion was fairly professional, but then Nate began to pry and wanted to know more about Sammy's finances and her personal life. She didn't even know this guy's last name, so she drew the line at disclosing that information. Nate then asked to see the new truck she had brought into the auto shop the day before. Together, they walked out the back of the store, where Nate then sexually assaulted Sammy. He threatened her and told her not to come after him, as he had a team of attorneys working for him but Sammy immediately called the police after the attack anyway. In August 2021, 53-year-old Deanne Jansen was nervously preparing her home for a first date with a man she had met on the dating app Tinder. Deanne's husband of 27 years passed away just over a year ago, and she was now working two jobs. She just started online dating but wasn't having much luck with it when she matched with 42-year-old Nate Holzapfel. It wasn't an instant love connection, but after three weeks of messaging, he managed to charm his way into a face-to-face -face date. As they hung out in Deanne's home, Nate started talking about himself. His father was a high-ranking member of the Mormon church. He went on Shark Tank and became Damon John's protege, and was now running several successful businesses. Deanne was impressed, but she was concerned about a few red flags. She told the Daily Beast news website that Nate openly expressed a fondness for Adolf Hitler, she was apparently able to overlook this and the pair began a romantic relationship. As he had done with Courtney Morton a year ago, Nate told Deanne he was divorced and they quickly began to talk about marriage. He made lofty promises about how his new businesses were going to take off and they would soon be living a life of luxury. He convinced Deanne to put $50,000 of her late husband's life insurance payout into one of his companies and promised her that she would get a 20x return on her investment. Nate also sold one of Deanne's cars and her AR-15 rifle and kept the proceeds. Deanne sensed there was something wrong, so she decided to Google Nate. She dug deeper past all his Shark Tank and business consulting stuff and eventually found a Reddit post about him. In the post, another Utah woman described how he had swindled her out of over $200,000. The author of that post was Courtney Morton. Deanne got in touch with Courtney, who revealed that she was currently working with detectives to arrest Nate. Only problem was that they couldn't track him down. Well, I'm having lunch with him tomorrow, Deanne said. They notified the police and the plan was set in motion. The following day, Nate showed up to his and Deanne's usual date spot, a Carl's Jr. Waiting police arrested him and charged him with three counts of second-degree felony communications fraud. Deanne and Courtney were thrilled that this con artist had been caught. However, their excitement didn't last long, as Nate was able to pay the $20,000 bail just 90 minutes later. Investigators from the Utah County Attorney's Office urged other victims of Nate to get in contact with them so proper justice could be carried out. Several other women did come forward, including Sammy Turnbow. In June 2023, Nate Holzapfel's defense team reached a plea agreement with the prosecution. Nate admitted to his crimes and pleaded guilty to multiple counts of communications fraud, theft by deception, engaging in a pattern of unlawful activity, forcible sexual abuse, theft, being an unlicensed broker, and lewdness. 
he would have to pay back a total of $300,000 to his victims, have zero contact with any victims, receive a mental health treatment, and serve 48 months probation. He would avoid prison time and avoid having to register as a sex offender. 17 other charges and two out of eight criminal cases against him would be dismissed and his name would be removed from Utah's white collar crime registry after completion of his probation. The deal also included a provision that the plea could be withdrawn if the judge did not sentence him to the recommended probation. The plea agreement took 18 months to negotiate. The women who Nate had defrauded and assaulted weren't happy that he wouldn't be going to prison. Sammy felt that Nate was essentially buying his way out of any real punishment. Utah County Deputy Attorney Peter Reichman explained that if they took all eight criminal cases to trial, it would get dragged out for years, which would mean it would take years for victims to get their restitution paid, if at all. On the 4th of August, 2023, Nate arrived at the courthouse in Provo, Utah for his sentencing. He smugly walked up to the waiting news crews with his two reluctant looking kids by his side, fully expecting to leave as a free man. At the hearing, Courtney Morton, Sammy Turnbo, and Deanne Jansen each gave victim statements. Their stories were all similar. Nate had scoped them out as homeowners or business owners, then took advantage of them during a difficult time in their lives. They argued that Nate was a predator and a danger to society. Throughout the hearing, Nate leaned back in his seat, appearing quite comfortable. As Judge Thomas Lowe looked over the plea deal, he noted that the court had not bound itself to the agreement. He rejected the provision that the plea could be withdrawn if he did not sentence accordingly with the probation recommendation, stating that it was, quote, directly contrary to Utah law. To everyone's shock, Judge Lowe overrode the plea deal and sentenced Nate to up to 15 years in prison, plus $300,000 in restitution. Nate was handcuffed then and there and taken into custody immediately following his sentencing. The three victims in the courtroom were astonished at the judge's decision, but ultimately glad to see Nate finally behind bars. 